at some point, we're just going to have to stop taking time off. See, the problem is, as much as we enjoy having time off and stepping away from the keyboard and microphone on occasion, the inevitable outcome always seems to be some sort of difficulty which not only crops up at the last minute, but then hangs over our head like the Sword of Damocles the whole time we're gone, only to finally drop when we return. And so, wait, have we never explained the Sword of Damocles? Ever? In the entire run of our nearly 300 episodes? Really? Unbelievable. In the 4th century BCE, Dionysius II of Syracuse was busy ruling his little bit of Sicily. By all accounts, he wasn't doing very well, lacking both experience and popular support. Turns out, the only thing worse than a tyrant is an incompetent tyrant, and Dionysius was certainly both of those. Now, as any of you with a bit of power over the fate of others will know, Within any group of people over whom you hold sway, there is always that one guy. In this case, Dionysius's that one guy was Damocles. Damocles was so eager to get ahead and so sure that he could butter Dionysius up to do so that he made it part of his daily, if not hourly, routine to just pop around to Dionysius's place and tell him how much he, Damocles, admired the king, Dionysius. Which, you know, it's nice to hear once in a while that someone else thinks you're doing a good job, usually through ratings and reviews, hint hint, but Damocles was making a fool of himself over it. He'd come around and tell Dionysius, oh gosh, you sure do have it good here, what with all your wealth and power, and then accidentally on purpose meet him in the courtyard a bit later and say, oh my, what a wise man you are, why, everyone is ever so pleased to follow your rule. And then, just as Dionysius was getting ready to head to bed, here would come Damocles with his little compliment about how magnificent he was and how much he really must be enjoying being in charge and how fortunate he was to be the grand high mucky muck of all he surveyed. You know the type. And frankly, even the most self-absorbed of leaders with a huge Narcissus complex would get a little tired of the same guy constantly ringing your praises just as you were about to step into the tub or sit down to a quiet meal with friends and family or have one of those all-important mid-afternoon power naps. So Dionysius came up with a little plan all his own to help Damocles shut the heck up. The next time Damocles came around with his mealy-mouthed praises, Dionysius said to him, Hey, I'm glad you think I'm such a much. You know, you've been very... What's the word? Supportive of me throughout our very extremely long and tedious acquaintance. I'd like to offer you a reward. How would you, Damocles, like to sit on the throne for a day and be king? We can switch places. It'll be fun. <laughs> Etc. And of course, Damocles accepted immediately and with great enthusiasm. Why, this was everything he'd ever wanted. And so it was arranged. The very next day, Damocles showed up and took his place on the throne and immediately surrounded himself with all the various luxuries available to one in such a position. There were lush carpets to walk on, richly embroidered tapestries to look at, fine food and drink to enjoy, and extravagant perfumes to inhale, not to mention one or two women who had very interesting etchings. He even had access to the royal treasury, filled as it was with gold and silver and jewels. But Damocles enjoyed none of it. Because, you see, Dionysius had added one other thing to the room. The king, as many kings do whether they intend to or not, and Dionysius had certainly intended to, had made many enemies in his life. All of whom wanted him either dead or deposed, possibly even both. And so, to help Damocles really, really appreciate all that was available to him, Dionysius had caused a sword to be hung over the royal throne the night before, and the only thing keeping the sword hanging in the air, point downwards over the throne Damocles was now sitting in, was a single horsetail hair tied around the pommel, and it was a very heavy sword, and a very thin thread, and Damocles could not take his eyes from it. 
finally understanding that even though everything seemed so wonderful and great and truly, truly amazing to Damocles from the outside, from the inside, as a king, Dionysius could never be entirely free from the sense of constant fear. His rise to power had been a cruel one, and that meant he could never relax and had to be constantly on his guard. His enemies hung over his head, just as the sword hung over Damocles. Within the hour, Damocles begged to be released from his bargain and departed, a much less ambitious man. And since that's not at all what we wanted to talk about, this must be another of our famous lost episodes. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. So, as you can see, we've wrongly used the Sword of Damocles metaphor. We're not kings, we haven't, as far as we know, made dangerous enemies that constantly hound us, and we certainly haven't gone around disingenuously complimenting our betters or switching positions with them. But since no one has used it properly since the time when Cicero first told the story in the first century BCE based on something he probably read from Greek historian Diodorus, it doesn't seem to matter all that much. All we really meant to explain was that every time we go on vacation, there seems to be some sort of disagreeable task waiting for us upon our return home. It makes it very hard to create episodes of the show, to pick a totally random example, if when you are meant to be relaxing and recharging, you are instead dealing with the manifold problems of everyday life that you were meant to be getting away from in the first place. Which is how you end up with one of our world-famous, no really, world-famous, lost episodes. Well, that and the fact that there are lots of little tidbits that don't make it into the regular show for one reason or another. Lately, though, it's mostly because we can't maintain focus enough to fully research something into a full, unique, standalone episode before something else intrudes rather rudely on our thought processes. At that point, the only thing to do is take all the scraps and leavings of both our earlier research and our scattered brains and sweep them into a big pile so we can all see the mess that's been made of things. One of the first things we ran across when sifting through the detritus on the floor was the word, or rather words, genius loci, or translated out of Latin, the spirit of a place. And to be honest, Genius Loci has been sitting around a long time waiting for us to do something with it. Unfortunately, the longer it sits undisturbed, the more likely it is to become dangerous. Which is exactly how Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition treated it. In the epic level handbook for that edition, which focused on D&D gameplay for powerful characters who had advanced beyond level 20 and were seeking new challenges and greater rewards, the genius Loci was presented as a creature of no intelligence, but massive impact. See, at one point in time, it was popular to assume that D&D fighters mostly just wanted to hit things, and were little interested in the niceties of life. They never took time to smell the roses, as it were. They just went from one combat to the next, swinging their swords and becoming ever more deadly and dangerous, but increasingly running out of sufficient enemies to challenge them. And if nothing particular presented itself to be attacked, your average fighter would occupy their time by attacking the landscape until something did present itself. Well, fine, thought someone at Wizards of the Coast. If fighters go around attacking the landscape when bored, maybe the landscape should fight back. That'll show them. And so, the genius Loki was ginned up and turned loose in the epic level handbook as a particularly formidable enemy. According to the designer in question, who remains wisely anonymous, the genius Loki is a massive, nay, colossal-sized ooze which would take on the form of the surrounding landscape and wait for a sentient being to come along so it could enslave it. Then, using the intelligence of that being, the ooze would turn it into their thrall and... Well, it's not exactly clear what parts two and three of its three-part plan were, since it tended to also take on the goals and attitudes of its slave in addition to its own. We presume that mostly it was just hilarious fun for the party fighter to declare they were attacking the grass, only for the GM to respond, Okay, Captain Wiseacre, the grass attacks you back, as do the trees, the rocks, and that bit of mud over there. Now what do you do? Oh, the fun we used to have. Genius Loki could turn up anywhere with a bit of landscape that had been left undisturbed for long enough. But really, 
Genius Loci was much more about the idea that particular places had their own guardian spirits, and the Romans, who came up with the concept because there simply weren't enough Roman gods in the pantheon already demanding their attention, would set up shrines to the Genius Loci of especially interesting or important places. Usually, they were depicted as a human figure bearing the gifts and abundance of their particular location. If you aren't quite getting it, consider Tom Bombadil from the Lord of the Rings books as the genius loci of Middle-earth, and you have it about right. He's basically the incorruptible spirit of all of Middle-earth. Except that the Roman version of the genius loci was entirely corruptible, given a Roman emperor with twisty enough thinking. See, Augustus and his friends reckoned that the emperor was basically the entire spirit of the empire. In effect, Augustus and all emperors after him were the genius of the Roman Empire, and as such, and because it was the custom at the time to make offerings to genius loci wherever they might be, a cult soon formed up around the emperor who, along with being the Roman Empire's genius, also took over the role of guardian of the crossroads, Lares Compitales. After all, they were the emperor's crossroads when it came right down to it, so why shouldn't he be considered their guardians? It wasn't long until there was a whole cult of the emperor with sacrifices made to them and everything. The more godlike a Roman emperor was, went the thinking, the more he could do as he liked, and the harder it would be for anyone to take them out without risking offending the gods themselves. Augustus did such a fine job of converting everything over to himself that the old terms were soon replaced with Lares Augusti and Genius Augusti instead. Fortunately, it mostly turned out that Roman emperors were really best at making enemies more than anything else. The next glittering object in the pile of human dust to catch our eye was a little gem we came across while trying to relax one evening in front of a cozily burning video game. Well, technically in front of a cozily burning live stream of a video game. You know how it is. Your brain is too fried to actually play the game yourself. So you go find someone else with a friendly manner and a desire to talk endlessly about the first thing that pops into their head at any given moment, whether it relates to anything happening on screen or not, and once you've given up on them and gone to find someone who just streams the game silently, you settle in and let your mind wander. Well, ours wandered, probably due to the game being played at us, to a particular genre of film and TV that cropped up everywhere in the 80s. The Ninja Film. Cinema and television in the 80s were all about stealthy Japanese assassins bent on killing off some troublesome warlord or powerful but corrupt ruler, and it didn't take very long for every red-blooded American kid to want to be one. We particularly recalled famous cowboy western film star Lee Van Cleef, who took a turn on TV late in his career as a character called The Master, on the show of the same name. The idea was Van Cleef's character, John Paul McAllister, was a World War II vet who elected to stay in Japan after the war and learn ninja-ing. Then, suddenly remembering a daughter he never met, he comes back to the States to find her. Along the way, he picks up a pupil played by Timothy Van Patten, who also wants to learn ninja-ing. And so, they drive around the country in the third van in the series, finding trouble wherever they go mostly from other ninjas trying to track McAllister down and kill him for leaving the ninja club without paying his back dues or something. We often thought that the various ninja movies and TV shows that cropped up in the 80s had to have some grain of truth to them. Maybe ninjas really were super stealthy and amazing masters of disguise and capable of disappearing in clouds of smoke. And maybe all their outfits and gear were part of the deal if you could just get a hold of some of it why you'd be halfway to being a ninja yourself. We were young and foolish, and there was no hope for it, but that's the way the thinking went. It was all so popular and so widespread that companies used to offer catalogs full of ninja stuff, throwing stars and nunchucks and black pajamas and everything, even Tabby. See, in our understanding, Tabby were more or less magical Japanese shoes and the key to being super stealthy. And if we could just get together the hundred or so dollars for just one pair of them, we could go anywhere, unheard and unseen. And what kid doesn't want to do that? What made them so special? Why, they had a split toe design. Not only did they make your feet nearly silent, 
but they also made it so you could climb anything with just your toes. At least we were pretty certain they did. That's what happened in the films, at least. So you can only imagine our disappointment to discover what Tabby really were. Socks. Just socks. For wearing with sandals. That's it. The toe is split to accommodate the little sandal strap that helps hold the sandal to the foot, and practically everyone wore them in Japan. They weren't special ninja shoes full of magic and power. They were just everyday plain old socks. Now, true, there was a version of tabby made as far back as the 15th century, formed from a single piece of animal hide, which is what tabby means, more or less. But by the time of all the ninja shows, those sorts of tabby hadn't really existed for centuries. Modern tabby were just woven cloth socks, not intended for outdoor use by themselves. Disappointing. Everyone owned socks already, and we were no more stealthy than anyone else with socks. Unless you know about Jika tabby. The problem is, Jika tabby are even less authentically ninja than regular tabby. In 1922, brothers Tokujiro and Shojiro Ishibashi, who founded the Bridgestone Tire Company, invented the rubber-soled tabby. Gradually, these evolved into a solid outdoor shoe that today gets used in much the same way as your favorite pair of work boots does. They turn up on the feet of construction workers, rickshaw pullers, and farmers, and come in much more sturdy versions made of tougher material that often incorporates a steel toe. They're still split-toed, but their ninja heritage is, without a doubt, non-existent. However, that hasn't prevented Western martial arts dojos and Hollywood films from trying to encourage the martial arts ninja tabby connection. Nor has it prevented us from laughing up our sleeves at everyone who went nutso for those shoes in which each toe was individually secured in its own little pocket a few years ago. We've been there, buddy, back in the 80s. You go on and have your fun. So as you can see, even in our supposedly idle moments, our brains are working away feverishly, looking for anything that might turn into the next episode. And sure, frequently we find it, but equally frequently the outside world intrudes upon our inner research assistant with its own demands on our time and concentration, and so we find ourselves arriving at episode creation time with no clear idea how we're going to proceed. Things are just too jumbled up for us to know where to begin, or on what, or even how. And then we get a bit desperate. Which is why we took notice when our number one fan had a particular reaction to a particular name. Not once, not twice, but three times on three separate occasions. Let's call it a snort of derision. Born sometime in the early 1100s, Eleanor of Aquitaine was the oldest child of William X, Duke of Aquitaine, and boy was she something else. For starters, her father made sure she had the best possible education available to her, even at a time when the education of women, no matter their status, was pretty well limited to basic household duties. Not so Eleanor, though. She received training in arithmetic, astronomy, and history, along with the usual batch of domestic skills. She was instructed in conversation and dancing and learned to play games like backgammon, checkers, and chess. She could ride and hunt and even excelled at hawking and, rather than being the typical woman of the time who was shy and retiring and stayed out of the way, Eleanor was intelligent, strong-willed, and extroverted. When her mother and younger brother died in 1130, she became next in line to inherit her father's duchy, all of Aquitaine, the richest and largest province of France. So. When her father left her with the Archbishop of Bordeaux, while he went on pilgrimage and then subsequently died, 15-year-old Eleanor suddenly found herself not only fabulously wealthy and powerful, but also the most eligible bachelorette in all of Europe. And the important thing to remember is that as far as all her potential suitors, and there would probably be many, were concerned, it was perfectly proper to kidnap your intended bride in order to seal the deal and thereby gain her title. 
Fortunately, Eleanor's father had foreseen this, and equally fortunately, he died slowly enough to dictate a will naming King Louis VI of France as her guardian, placing both her and her new holdings under his care. Also, he was to find her a suitable husband. Now, Louis VI was gravely ill himself, but he had control of all her lands until such time as she should marry. And it just so happened he had a son, also called Louis, who needed a wife for when he assumed the throne, which looked like it would be any day now. A marriage which would bring all of Aquitaine under the control of the French crown forever. It took about half a day to make all the arrangements, and by July, Eleanor and young Louis were married. The only saving grace of the whole thing, as far as Eleanor was concerned, was that Aquitaine would remain independent of France until Eleanor's future oldest son was able to take the throne as King of France and Duke of Aquitaine. Eleanor would remain in control of Aquitaine until such an occasion transpired. By Christmas 1137, Louis VI died, and Louis VII took the throne. Eleanor proved unpopular at court for, guess why? Yes, being too forward and thinking her own thoughts, more or less, and then having the gall to speak them out loud where just anyone could hear them, including the men who were supposed to be getting on with running the country. And when Louis got in trouble with the church for not backing the Pope's pick for a recently vacated archbishopric, the Pope thought that it was mostly Eleanor's fault. He suggested that she be taught manners, which upset Louis so much he barred the Pope's pick from ever even entering the town he'd been assigned to, and then got into a war with the French count who gave the unseated archbishop shelter. And then a lot happened. Like, a lot, a lot. An assault on a town turned nasty when people sheltering at the local church, about a thousand of them, all died when the king's army set it alight. Then an excommunication, which, when Eleanor tried to patch things up on her own initiative, got her scolded, and finally a crusade to the Holy Land to try to expunge Louis's guilt over the whole thing. Where it turned out that Louis was a terrible military leader, and he got almost all his men killed, and nearly himself as well into the bargain. All of which achieved nothing. And, as if that wasn't enough for poor Louis and Eleanor, their marriage was on the rocks as well. Eleanor went looking for an annulment, but Louis was still interested in having an heir, and no one would grant her request. It wasn't until the birth of Eleanor's second child, a daughter like the first, that it became clear things were not going to improve any time soon. Soon, both of them were looking to have the marriage annulled. Eventually, they were able to prove that they were too closely related to have been legally married in the first place, since they were both third cousins once removed, which was too close for comfort. An annulment was finally granted. And the story of Eleanor of Aquitaine really is extremely interesting, and there's a lot of it we're leaving out for the sake of time. But she eventually remarries to Henry II, Duke of Normandy, which she does because Henry's brother kidnaps her to marry himself and secure her lands. When she arrives at his brother's house, she writes the duke and says, Hey, your brother's kind of a creep. I demand you marry me instead. And he does. Eight weeks after her annulment from Louis. Even though Eleanor and Henry were even more closely related. And then, much to everyone's surprise probably, Henry II, Duke of Normandy, suddenly becomes Henry II, King of England. And Eleanor is his queen. They have a bunch of kids, male and female, a couple of whom you'll no doubt recall if you listen to our episode on kings, Richard I or Richard the Lionhearted, and of course, King John. One of her daughters marries into Louis's new family back in France, and still, there's a whole bunch of other stuff to know about Eleanor of Aquitaine, from her capture and imprisonment, her controlling nature with her sons, and the fact that she probably ran quite a lot of two entire countries just on the strength of her own will and no one was too pleased about any of it. Along the way, she made many powerful enemies of one sort or another. Which brings us to the one thing we wanted to point out about Eleanor of Aquitaine. We told you all that to tell you this. Eleanor of Aquitaine is considered the grandmother of Europe. Pretty much all of it. Because nine of her ten children went on to become royalty or married into it. And between children and grandchildren, they made up the royalty of England... France, Denmark, Castile, Sicily, and several other kingdoms. 
and with that kind of career, and the sorts of enemies she made from all walks of life, from the clergy to the peasantry, and even to other royalty, she'd have known all about and completely understood the sword of Damocles. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We've got a couple of quick announcements for you. If you haven't heard, we're switching to a fortnightly schedule. That way we can produce both GM Word of the Week and our sister show, Folklire, which we hope you've checked out. So look for us again in two weeks, and in the in-between weeks, enjoy Folklire. Also, we've begun shifting our method of support away from Patreon and towards Buy Me a Coffee. Partially, this is because we want to bring everything we do under one umbrella, and Buy Me a Coffee has an umbrella that seems to understand our needs better than Patreon. Mainly, though, Patreon isn't what it used to be when it comes to supporting all its customers. So if you would like to help support this show, and also support everything else we do, check out our Buy Me a Coffee link in the show description. It's very flexible and far more accommodating for you than Patreon. Got questions about it all? feel free to drop us a line. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. We suppose it was more the penknife of Damocles. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. I need a vacation from my vacation. <laughs>